Well, chapter 39 of the book of Jeremiah is here. This is the chapter we've been waiting for for a long time. This is the chapter where Jeremiah, or not Jeremiah, excuse me, where Jerusalem is finally sieged. So remember, Babylon came down to siege Jerusalem, to besiege Judah because Judah rebelled. Egypt came up to fight to defend Judah. So Babylon had to move their armies over to fight Egypt. So a little bit of a reprieve of the siege of Jerusalem. They backed Egypt off. Egypt had to flee and retreat. Then Babylon came back to Jerusalem, and now the full siege is going to happen. They've been waiting. They've waited out them. They spent, I think it was about 18 months, if I remember right, that uh, Babylon sieged Jerusalem, just waited outside. Anybody left the city, they got executed. If you... Um, Stayed in the city, they just waited for you to run out of food and start starving to death. Then Babylon attacked. That's what we're going to see here, is this, the siege is happening and then the destruction. So uh, verse 1 says, In the ninth year of Zedekiah king of Judah, in the tenth month, came Nebuchadrezzar king of Babylon and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. So... They were there, they left, they came back, right towards the end of the ninth year. Uh, so this was about July 587 BC, that Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. A month earlier, Nebuchadrezzar, or Nebuzardan, commander of Nebuchadrezzar's bodyguard, arrived at the city. The siege had lasted from January 588 till July 587 BC, with a brief interlude in the summer of 588. The years were counted from the Babylonian New Year in the spring, which is March and April. That is from the month of Nisan. So that's kind of where they're starting the year calendar. Uh, so verse 2, And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. So 18 months of siege with a brief reprieve in the middle, and then Babylon comes back, and then they take the city. The city is broken down. Verse 3, And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal Sherezer, Samgar Nebu, Sarsakim, Rab Sarsaris, Nergal Sherezer, Rab Mag, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. So they were able to enter Jerusalem as the army is just annihilating them. Remember, Jeremiah prophesied that Israel's army. Judah's army, I should say, would not survive this. They wouldn't be able to defend themselves. They'd be like they're trying to fight with both hands tied behind their back. So it collapses and falls apart quickly, basically. Uh, so Babylon's army is in Jerusalem. The princes are in Jerusalem to oversee the siege, the rest of the battle, to look for the goods, the things they can take back to Babylon with them. Verse 4 and it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls. And he went out of the way, out the way of the plain. So verse four is telling us that during this destruction, Babylon breaks the walls. They get in, they are storming the city, killing as all the Jews they can find, they're just murdering people, stealing stuff. I'm sure there was a lot of uh, sexual abuse, rape, and things happening at the same time. They're robbing all the places. They're torching the houses. Total, complete chaos in Jerusalem. Zedekiah the king goes to his garden. There's a secret door that allows him to get out of the city. He's out of the city, and he's heading over the plains, the open field areas, probably in Megiddo or something like that. He's not staying to fight. He's not staying to stand up to the Babylonians. He's out of there. That's the kind of king Zedekiah was, saving himself. Verse 5, But the Chaldeans' army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. Also, Jericho, the direction they were going. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah, in the plain of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. So Zedekiah leaves, probably some of his bodyguards, some people with him. Somebody in the Chaldean army, they see him. Hey, there's there goes the king. He's heading up that way. Go get him. So a group of soldiers probably go off to go get him. 
they catch him up there, bring him to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar's in Ribla. He's not in Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had a couple of other fronts, a couple other wars he was fighting. So his commanders were dealing with Jerusalem and the princes were there. He was off doing another thing. So they brought Zedekiah to him. Remember, there's, this is fulfilling prophecy that Jeremiah said he would see Nebuchadnezzar eye to eye. Okay, so the, the town of Riblah in the land of Hamath, this is an ancient Syr Syrian town uh, to the south of Kadesh on the river Orontes. It was situated at a strategic point where military highways between Egypt and Mesopotamia met. Evidently, Nebuchadnezzar remained at his headquarters in central Syria while his general pursued the war in Judah. Prisoners were brought to the king for judgment. So they were brought to him, and then he got to decide what to do with them. And that's starting in verse 6. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Riblah, the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah, before his eyes. So Zedekiah is basically tied down, and he's being forced to watch his family be executed in front of him. It probably was brutal, too. It probably wasn't like, you know, let's oust them all at once, line them all up, slay them all real quick. It's probably one at a time, killing them, probably me, possibly even torturing them a little bit. Maybe we don't know. Um, but Zedekiah has to watch this. Now, this is devastating to Zedekiah for two reasons. One, it's his family. Those are his children being killed. Two, it also means no royal lineage for Zedekiah and his line. His line's cut off. No one will remember him. He'll have no more ancestors, basically. No more descendants, basically, going from him. So the end of his line of rule, his kings, there will be none of his children to challenge Nebuchadnezzar for the throne at Jerusalem because they will all be killed. So he's watching all this happen. Uh, the king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah. And then, moreover, after this, he put, out the, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. So that's Zedekiah. So he gets to meet face-to-face, eye-to-eye with, with Nebuchadnezzar, like Je Jeremiah prophesied. And then he watches his family get executed, and then his eyes are poked out, basically. So he's still alive. They put a chain on him, and they make him walk behind a cart, basically, to Babylon, hundreds of miles. He has to walk with no eyes, basically. His eyes are poked out. They have to heal and do all that. You know, they didn't have painkillers. They didn't have anesthesia surgeries back then. You just suffered. You just had to live with the pain. They, that's what he had to do. And then he went back to Babylon and was a prisoner for the rest of his life, basically. Now, uh, there is a story... Uh, I'm trying to remember which, which ancient, ancient document this is in, but there's a story that uh, if, you're from, if you've read the Book of Mormon and are familiar with it, there is a story in the Book of Mormon, too, that talks about a group of people called the Mulekites. They claim to be descendants of Mulek, the son of Zedekiah. As the story goes, it's mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and there's actually an ancient document that verifies this from the Middle East, that when the siege happened, some of the high priests in the temple realized what was what was happening, and they smuggled Mulek, Zedekiah's son, out of Jerusalem. They got him out of there, basically. Probably headed to the Mediterranean, smuggled him on a boat to get him to the far end of the earth, basically. Get him out of there. Well, this document says he fled Jerusalem, got smuggled out of the area, but they don't know how else happened. No one wrote back a letter going, hey, we're safe, we're fine, we're having a great time over here, whatever, you know. There was no no feedback for them, so the, the story ended there. In the Book of Mormon, it talks about these people coming over and settling in the Americas. And then the Nephites meet with them and, and kind of join forces with them in about the middle of the Book of Mormon. So another fun story we're going to talk about when we get into the Book of Mormon. But it ties into this moment here in time with Jeremiah. So let's move forward here. Verse 8, And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Now in chapter 52, we're going to see that they're also going to say that they burned the temple down. To they destroy the temple. 
So you can see where they push walls over. You can see the, the stones on the ground. They used to be up high. Uh, still to this day, you can see some of that. This is known when the temple is destroyed and taken care of at this time. Remember, this is the temple that Solomon built. This is the temple that Solomon put together. So this is the end of the what's known as the first temple period. So the first temple period is from Solomon's time to the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC. That's the first temple. Then there's the period of time, the 70 years of exile, that they don't have a temple. It's a little, little more than just that, but they don't have a temple. And then they eventually build, the exiles will build a new temple. And that temple is going to last until after Jesus' time when Rome comes in, in the siege of 70 AD, and destroys it. That's the second temple period. So we've just ended the first temple period, basically, right in this chapter. That's where we're at. So if you ever hear that term used, realize when they mention this happened during the first temple period, that's before the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. So a little bit of a historical marker for you. Verse 9, then Nebu, Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon, the remnant of the people that remained in the city and those that fell away that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. But Neber, Nebuzar Adon, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. So here's what's interesting. Is all the people who had artisan skills, the lawyers, the doctors, the, you know, if you had a profession, you were a white-collar worker, you were professional in your field, you had a chance of rising up against Babylon, you, had a, you were a potential future threat, they carted them all off to be prisoners in Babylon. The poor, the people who had nothing, were the ones that were left. They weren't messed with. Why were they not messed with? Because they're not going to rise up. They have no resources. There's no way for them to be a threat to Babylon. So they were left behind. So those are the ones that inherited the land, was the really super poor people. They didn't own a home anyways. They didn't have anything. That's who was left, basically. So they took everybody else with them to Babylon as a prisoner. Uh, verse 11, Now Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look well to him and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. Now, this is, this is interesting what's happening here. You see, uh, not only is it likely that Judean deserters were pressed for information about what was going on in Jerusalem as a way to get intel, Babylon could use, they, they could use that intel in the war. So as Babylon marched in, they looked for the, the people who were the defectors of Jerusalem they were outside the walls, and they would ask them for intel about what's going on inside the walls. Uh, so these are probably the deserters that Jeremiah's prophecies, they were, you know, they're the ones that surrendered to Babylon. So they survived. The people in Jerusalem did not survive, except for the Rechabites we learned in chapter 35. But now Nebuchadnezzar is saying, take care of Jeremiah. And it's probably the word got out, the prophet Jeremiah is telling, ba telling Jerusalem to surrender to Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar is probably like, I like this guy. This guy's great. He's, he's, he's on my side. Let's take care of him. He's a good guy. So they're taking care of him. Verse 13, so Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guards, sent and Nebu Bashan, Rab Saris, and Nergal Sherazer, and Rab Mag, and all the king of Babylon's princes. So they went and got them together. Verse 14, even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahakam, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home. So he dwelt among the people. So while this is happening, remember this siege coming in, Zedekiah flees, people are being murdered everywhere and stuff stolen. Where's Jeremiah? He's still in prison. He's in the court of the guard, how basically. So the, the Babylonians go get him out of prison, say, hey, don't fear us. We're here to help you. And they tell Gedaliah, you're in charge of him. See that he's okay. Uh, now this one, this account is a little different though. There's two, two versions of this story. 
Okay, in chapter 40, we're going to see the other version of this. So this account is somewhat different from the one in, ver in chapter 40, where Nebu Nebuzar Adam, the commander of the guard, found Jerus Jeremiah in fetters among the whole train of captives at Ramah, five miles north of Jerusalem. So he, in chapter 40, Jeremiah was captured, put in chains, and was being marched to Jerusalem with the rest of the professional class of Jerusalem, basically. Uh, and then they pulled him out and says, And having released him, spoke with him the options of the options open to him. It is thus clear that the editor had two stories before him, both of which were included in the book. So whoever put the book of Jeremiah together had these two stories. And he probably didn't know which one was which, so he put both of them in the book. and said, I'm going to let the reader decide what they want to believe. The story in verse 11 through 14 reads as a straightforward, consistent narrative. We can only presume that after his initial trial, he was set free but was pe picked up by soldiers, put in chains, and sent to the holding camp at Ramah for transport to Babylon via Ribla. So he was now captured, but now there is, wait, 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 no, that's Jeremiah, let him go. He's okay. So why did they give Jeremiah to Gedaliah? Well, Gedaliah was appointed by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, to be the governor of Judah, basically. Whatever's left, you're the governor of it. So he was there to be a governor to pay homage to Nebuchadnezzar, basically, as a vassal state. So he was governing over the poor people, basically, that were left in the land. Uh, and we're going to see him come up again here pretty soon, in fact. Uh, verse 15, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, so this is, the story is going back in time now. So Jeremiah's been out of prison. He's free. He's under the watch of the governor, the care of the governor. But now, verse 15, we're going to go back in time to when uh, a prophecy that Jeremiah got when he was still in prison during the siege. Uh, so that's that's what's going to happen here. My, many scholars think it was added here to help us understand that Ebed Mel each did survive the siege. So that we're going to look at this now. This is verse 16. So Jeremiah is being told, Go and speak to Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon the city for evil and not for good, and they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. Now remember, this is the Ethiopian from the story that is that, that convinced Zedekiah, told Zedekiah, hey, look, the princes are trying to passively kill Jeremiah by throwing him in the cistern. So he got, he saved Jeremiah's life. He got Jeremiah out of that area, basically. So now this is a revelation to Jeremiah to go talk to Go talk to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, and let him know what God thinks of him. So in verse 17, But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the man of whom thou art afraid. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. So the Lord's happy with Ebed Melech and tells him, you're going to be okay. You're going to survive this. Do not worry. God's protecting you. You're going to be okay. So what happened to him? We don't exactly know. He was probably part of the poor people that were left in Jerusalem. Uh, it doesn't seem like he got captured and moved over to Babylon, but he at least survived. He lived through this, basically. So Jerusalem is gone. It's, it's technically still there, but there's no city wall. The whole city's been burned to the ground. The temple's destroyed. The king's palace is destroyed. There's not a lot left of this city. It's, it's all in ruins. Only the, the poor people are left. Everybody else has been taken. This is the second exile to Babylon, the major one. So remember Daniel and um, Ezekiel and some of those other ones were in the first one in, in 597 BC. This is 587 BC. It's gone. The destruction has happened. The wickedness of the people has been wiped out. So now, let's move forward as we continue this story in the next chapter.